kind of the same, it's just that my notes are a little bit more involved, but I brought a copy just to make sure I gave you the right information. I got involved with LAP, the Legal Assistance Program, because I was in a, I was looking to save money on my malpractice insurance, and so I was sitting in a CLA class. And as I watched the presentation, I started to get really sad because my father was an alcoholic, so he was functional. He, he, he lasted till he was 89, but my brother wasn't so successful. It's gonna be three years this Memorial Day weekend. We don't know the day that he died because he was found after nobody heard from him for a while by his ex-wife and his two children dead. Uh, he had fallen, probably because he was drunk, and died when he was 50 years old. And so I thought, it, it, my whole family has had a tremendous amount of guilt about it, even though we know in our head we're not responsible because he didn't get treated for a terminal disease. So I started to get involved with LAP, and I found out so many great things about this program. First of all, it's not for profit. It's funded by your dues. Uh, and uh, by the Illinois Supreme Court and the, admin uh, the administrator of the <coughs> Illinois courts. And it's free. It's free. It's confidential, as you heard just now. Uh, there's a Supreme Court rule that allows you to report somebody else or to get help yourself. And we, we're bound by confidentiality the same way as we are in our private practices. It is, it's staffed by attorneys and judges and trained volunteers, people that understand what you're going through. I was having, I was starting to get stressed just watching all the terrible things that can happen to attorneys when I was watching the ARDC presentation. Uh, I, I actively removed myself from court about over three years ago to devote myself to writing and teaching, and I can't tell you how much stress level is way, 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 way down. Uh, the um, board members are appointed by the Illinois Supreme Court. They're made up of judges and attorneys. And uh, you already saw Rule 1.6, I'm not going to belabor that. If you ever have a hemal problem that may involve <coughs> some kind of drug alcohol or a mental health issue, the executive director of the Legal Assistance Program is very willing to sit down and talk with you and try to help you walk, walk you through that or refer you to someone who can give you good advice. So we support judges, and lawyers, and law students. We have drop-ins at law school because that's where it starts. The, uh, the depression, the anxiety, the stress, that's where it starts. Uh, LAP does evaluations and assessments and recommendations and does counseling as well. So we educate, and then we educate the legal community on what our services are about as well as on these really important issues involving basically brain issues. So we provide referrals, we do interventions, we manage and monitor clients, we have peer support volunteers, <coughs> we can identify and evaluate resources for, for you. about stigma, especially with mental health issues, you know, even getting uh, help for addiction, which is, is more common. 
uh, 14% come from law school referrals. College and employers, 12%. The ARDC, character and fitness, 10%. Uh, families, you know, spouses, children, parents refer uh, people <coughs> to the lab. And then um, other uh, providers may refer an attorney to lab because of additional issues that come up in, uh, in terms of uh, getting help. Now the age range really uh, struck me because more than 50% are less than 40 years in age. 34% are younger than 30. And 23% are between the ages of 30, 30 to 40, 18%, uh, 40 to 50, 14%, 50 to 60, 12% older than, uh, greater than, than 60. Attorneys suffer from depression at a rate that's 3.6 times what the general population suffers. So we are toward the top of professions that end up with clinical depression, anxiety. Uh, there's a greater risk of heart disease, probably a lot due to alcoholism and drug use. And there's a 70% chance of developing alcohol-related problems as opposed to 13.7% of the general population. So there's a lot of us suffering. A lot of us suffering. The, the ABA study indicated that 18% uh, of attorneys are problem drinkers, uh, which is much more than the general population. So this is, is really quite a serious matter. Age does seem to be a predictor of impairment, especially when you're young. So if you're young, there's a much better chance that you're uh, having greater problems with alcohol. And I really think it's kind of a generational thing based on what I see with my own adult children and their friends. There seems to be a lot more emphasis on mommy drinking wine and, and joking about it. And there's just, it just seems like the culture is, is pervasive. The kind of issues that we see in lack in terms of how people present to us is the majority are mental health issues, depression, uh, anxiety, OCD, suicidal ideation. Substance abuse makes up 35%. But of course, we really need a Zen diagram because the mental health overlaps with the substance abuse. There was a, a program once where basically the, the presenter from Gateway said that if, if you have someone with an alcohol or drug abuse, there's probably some underlying depression or some other mental health issue, whether it's bipolar or whatever. So a lot of these things do overlap. And then the remaining 10% are for other issues such as gambling addiction, sex addiction, aging, cognitive issues, and perhaps criminal issues like DUI, of course, that's usually related to alcohol. So there's, there is quite a bit of overlap. Now, what do you think is the most commonly abused substance that we see at LAP? Alcohol. Yeah. Alcohol makes up uh, about 80% of the referrals that we see. Why is it that, that attorneys uh, like to use alcohol? First of all, it's legal. Right? We like to do legal things. So it's something that we can buy on our own. It's easily accessible. It's affordable. And it's culturally acceptable. In fact, if you don't drink, like my husband, who he doesn't have a problem with alcohol, he just never likes the taste. He's one of those 10% of people that have taste buds that <coughs> taste bitter, like, like alcohol, so he just won't drink it. But the looks he gets when, when he says, no, I'll, I'll have a, a soft drink, at a fancy restaurant, it's like, what's wrong with you? you know? And so it, it's very acceptable to, to go out after a hard day, to go home after a hard day and have a glass of wine or a glass of scotch or whatever. And uh, it can get us into trouble, especially when we have other stressors that are rearing their head. The, uh, there was a study in 2016 of over almost 13,000 lawyers funded by the Hazelden Betty Ford 
uh, foundation, and they took a look at problems that lawyers have. And what they found were that 21% self-reported problems with alcohol, 28% with depression, 19% uh, with anxiety, and 23% with chronic stress. That's a lot of people. I mean, in an audience this size, when you start talking about 23% this, 28% that, it seems like almost everyone is touched by these issues. Uh, maybe you're not suffering yourself, but maybe you know a colleague that is, or a judge. We had a number of judges in DuPage County that ended up having to go into treatment uh, for various uh, problems in years that I was prosecuting out there. And colleagues that I knew. Lawyers I could smell coming during the court call, you know, and, and I've seen people get treatment, fall off the wagon, get treatment, because it, it, it takes a lot of effort over time to, to address these issues. There's more men that reported problems than women, 53.4% of men responded versus 46.5% of females. But of course, with the women, they used to go downhill faster based on them. Now let's look at the reported treatment rates from this study, which are just really sad. People who sought mental health services, or uh, certain people who had mental health issues, 37% got help, which means that 63% did not. Those with alcohol or drug addiction, only 7%. That is really, really scary. And of course, my brother falls into the, into the, into the green category. He lied about getting help repeatedly, but he never actually took a step to help himself. Now, why is it that people don't come forward, even though they've already identified that they have problems with their issues of this nature. Why, why are people coming forward? It's hard in a big group like this, isn't it? You see when I have 10 people in a room, everybody's you know, jumping up and down. Well, some people, are, lawyers are worried about confidentiality. They're worried that it's going to affect their practice, their ability to earn money, to support themselves or their families or their loved ones. And so they're worried about that. You don't have to worry about that in Illinois because of lab. They can help you in complete confidentiality. Stigma, people are much more reluctant, apparently, to let people know about their mental health issues as opposed to alcohol. People understand alcohol. People drink too much. Oh, yeah. But it, it, there's still a stigma to alcohol issues. Uh, time away from work, I have to go into rehab. How am I going to, what am I, how am I going to take care of my clients? And the cost. Again, lab can help you with the cost. There, uh, there's a separate foundation that we can all contribute to to help fund uh, treatment for, for attorneys who don't have the resources, they can help coordinate with insurance, and as well as provide group support and some individual counseling at the offices at no cost. Uh, in the general public, people say that they don't get help because they're not ready to stop drinking. That's probably a big factor for many people. They don't have sufficient health care coverage, the negative effect on their job, community neighbors making ne negative comments or holding a, an opinion of them. They don't know where to go for treatment, or no program has the treatment that's desired, or they don't have transportation or the hours are inconvenient. So let's look at some of these factors that, that go into why attorneys have such a high rate. Well, first of all, uh, we tend to be very pessimistic by nature as attorneys. I don't know if we start off that way or we get that way in law school and then certainly when we get into practice, after you see human nature on a grand scale, uh, the pessimism certainly creeps in. We're very competitive by nature. This is an adversary system, whether we like it or not. 
Some of us maybe weren't made for adversary systems. I know I wasn't, yet I was a prosecutor my entire career. And so you have to adjust to that. And we're perfectionists. A lot of attorneys have OCD issues, obsessive compulsive disorder, which is great when it comes to making sure that all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed and, and that you've done everything possible for your client. But when it comes to judging ourselves, it can be very detrimental. Our life factors. Is our, is our spouse supportive or not if we have a spouse? Or maybe we don't have a spouse and we wish we had a partner or, or, or to get married. Or uh, children. I, read, I don't know how I did it. I had three kids about five years apart between, and I ran my own private practice. It was insane. I don't know how I did it. Uh, luckily, I had a, a helpful partner. He didn't like the fact that I was a lawyer, but he was very good about taking care of the kids. But all those stresses, your health, you're going through health problems. Finances are a big issue for attorneys, especially since the Great Recession, where maybe you're starting to do other areas of practice just to make money that you're not, you don't feel confident in. Or student debt. The young people coming out of college these days, I know my nephew has about $200,000 in debt going, going to law school. It, it's, it's an enormous burden. Uh, or organizational factors, depending on where you work. It can be uh, a lot of pressure with little credit. Somebody's got to win and somebody's got to lose. Uh, client excessive workload when you're the low person on the total pole. Client expectations. They expect you to just make everything perfect. They, don't, they won't listen to the realistic assessment that you have of their situation. How do you deal with that day in and day out? And then what is our definition of success? You know, what burden do we put on ourselves? So there's a lot of reasons why attorneys are stressed out. And we have to watch out for the danger signs. Uh, when it comes to substance abuse, is our tolerance for drugs or alcohol increasing? What is our pattern of consumption? An occasional drink becomes one every night. Or maybe we wait for the weekends and then we just let ourselves go. Is there a change in that? Are de de decreased inhibitions? Do we find ourselves saying things that maybe, maybe we shouldn't to colleagues because we're working off the hangover the night before? If we can't stop after one or two drinks, that's a huge red flag that we're having a problem with alcohol. Wanting a drink to relax versus needing a drink or a substance to relax is another issue. And now as we go into the whole thing about legalized marijuana, what road is that going to take us down? There's so many, we haven't really studied it very well because the government hasn't allowed us to, it hasn't allowed scientists to explore you know, what it does to the brain over time. Will it decrease our inhibitions? Will it, will it um, affect, I, I was reading an article that indicated that there was starting to be a higher incidence of schizophrenia in marijuana users later in life, which is not something that is very common. So there's an awful lot we don't know about where this is going because we're kind of involved in an experimental age with respect to it. Now what um, the ADA solo practice journal has come up with is MAP, M-A-P, which is an acronym for what to look for when you're dealing with substance abuse. First, we're going to look at, are you seeing mood or attitudinal disturbances in your colleagues? Someone who is normally uh, very outgoing suddenly becomes isolated, or vice versa. Uh, appearance or physical changes, people aren't taking care of themselves the way they used to. What about their productivity and quality of work? If you see these three things, this is a sign to be aware of what's going on uh, in this person's life. Somebody that was is always rude and uncivil, uh, and then they be, they're acting like a jerk. Well, that's not as important as someone who was always pretty kind and, and civil and now is a jerk. So something, something may be happening in their brain. Anxiety. And there's a lot of different types of uh, Warning signs of anxiety. I suffer from anxiety myself. 
uh, over and over again. Just recently, well, not that recently, but when my around the time my brother died, within one month, my husband was hospitalized for an infection, possibly sepsis. The following week, I broke my foot on Mother's Day. The week after that, I got hit by a semi-trailer who sideswiped me on purpose on 294, and then two weeks later, my brother died. I needed help. I needed to talk to somebody because I felt like I couldn't feel anything anymore because I, I, I just kept taking these punches, and I, I couldn't feel like I could get up off the floor. So there are times in our life when we have situations that are just so overwhelming that we need to reach out to other people to help us get past it. And, and I was very glad that I did, and I did get past it, uh, but it was really uh, difficult at the time. So if your symptoms unexplained trembling, headaches, rumination, you know that tape recorder in your mind that won't let you go to sleep at night because you're worrying about uh, tomorrow's case, digestive problems. A lot of times we think, oh, we're having gastrointestinal disorders or something, and we, they can't come up with any physical cause. The mind and, and the body, uh, the rest of the body, are closely connected, and we shouldn't forget that. Increased worry, irritability. I see that a lot with one of my loved ones who suffers from anxiety and depression. And I always know things are gonna go rocky because he starts to get sarcastic and irritable, and it's a symptom of, of the, the mental disorder that this person suffers from. Decreases in productivity, unexplained pains, perfectionism, I already talked about that. Fatigue, sometimes we're just so tired, we think we're working really hard, but it can also be a sign of, of anxiety as well as depression. So if, if your colleagues are saying to you, I just can't cope, Get off my back. I can't come in today. You know, I more absences than usual. I need more time to get this done for someone who is always on top of things. I'm scared I'm going to get fired. I just couldn't get it done. These are people. Listen to people when they say these things to you. They may be trying, they may think they're telling you that they're anxious or depressed, but they, they're not putting it into the general terms. Now, and anxiety, what it does is it triggers our flight or fight, our fight response. Cortisol courses through our body, and if we can't run away like we did when we were cave persons, then we have to stay, but sometimes we can't fight because we have to maintain our cool in front of judges who maybe don't know as much as we do, uh, and uh, clients who are demanding, or opposing attorneys who are, are not civil. And anxiety can take its time in many different forms. Uh, what happens to an introvert that has to go court all the time? They put themselves out there. They can divide, you know, they, they, they develop a social anxiety that, that is, is can be somewhat dis uh, debilitating. Uh, PTSD, the um, person I mentioned who suffers from anxiety and, uh, and depression, that's the underlying cause, PTSD. We have a number of colleagues who are trying to deal with childhood sexual abuse. And it may not manifest itself until adulthood when the mind and the body is finally ready to deal with it. But that can cause a lot of people that I dealt with uh, who suffer from childhood sexual abuse end up self-medicating. Uh, I was very involved in the child abuse uh, scandal and met a lot of survivors. I work closely with SNAP. Uh, the survivors met those abused by priests, and a lot of those people, a lot of the people, a lot of survivors deal with um, self-medication. It happens uh, quite a bit. Uh, OCD, I mentioned before, and then just generalized anxiety. That's, that's a, a real dilemma, because it's one thing to know why you're anxious. It's a situational thing. But just have the, general, uh, the generalized anxiety uh, can be very, uh, very debilitating. And of course, how do we deal with social anxiety? We drink, right? It loosens us up, makes us more fun, makes us have more fun at the party. Let's talk about depression, because that can lead to very serious ramifications among our colleagues. Uh, 
Uh, we have people have difficulty thinking, concentrating, or making decisions, changes in appetite, feelings of worthlessness or guilt, loss of interest in activities that we previously enjoyed. That's a big like changes in sleep patterns, fatigue again, uh, thoughts, plans, and attempts at suicide can also result from chronic depression. So again, listen for when a colleague is saying, I just don't feel right, I feel like I'm on an emotional roller coaster, I just don't feel like doing anything anymore, nothing's fun anymore. That's a real serious red flag. I just can't get things done on time. Uh, I have to constantly do everything over and over. I can't get anywhere on time. I just want to be left alone. I have a hard time feeling happy or interested in anything these days. These are all really uh, things and red flags to watch out for. Uh, dropping out of activities that you previously enjoyed. Going to the gym seems too hard. Simple tasks take a lot more effort to accomplish. Even bathing and, and, and dressing may take longer. Cooking dinner seems pointless. People, uh, lawyers being angry with themselves for making less money when actually it's the result of the economy and the nature of the business. Just having unrealistic expectations about oneself that lead to feelings of unworth. These are all things that can lead attorneys and law students and judges to end up, end up with depression. You already saw one example of talking about an attorney who commits suicide. Uh, look for expressions of hopelessness, powerlessness, worthlessness, shame, guilt, self-hatred, and in 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 inadequacy. If somebody is saying those kinds of things to you, don't try to talk them out of it in terms of trying to say, oh, you shouldn't be that way, things like that, you're, you're wonderful. That doesn't work. Declining performance and interest at work, feelings of worthlessness and guilt, loss of interest and participation in social activities, hobbies, relationships. People that you used to go out with or see socially who suddenly are you know, isolating themselves. Um, isolation. Dysregulation of sleeping and eating habits where you know, they're not taking care of themselves. They're drinking. At the end, my brother was drinking most of his calories. You know, and the only reason we knew that was because of the my brother had had access to my brother's bank account because he was really bad with money, and he could see the the charges at the liquor store and the, and the delivery charges. So he knew that even though he said he wasn't drinking, he was doing it on a regular basis. By that time, we had basically stepped back and said, you're killing yourself, we don't want to be a part of it. Um, very difficult. A question needs to commit suicide, buying a gun, stockpiling prescriptions. If somebody's doing that, they're planning. And you really need to pay attention if they're making a plan, where, when, how. Uh, my first encounter with suicide was my daughter was in, um, she was in middle school and the coach of her basketball team committed suicide. You know, how do you explain that to you know, a, a 12 year old. Uh, he had suffered, it turns out we found out he had suffered from lifelong Great Depression, had been, you know, uh, in ho been hospitalized numerous times. Very nice man, never suspected a thing until it did happen. Giving away possessions is huge, and you shouldn't ignore something like that. Thoughts or feelings about suicide. Despondent mood. Um, alpha, increased alcohol or, and, and, and drug use. There was a, a, a suicide in King County of an attorney in 2018. Nobody saw the signs coming. So it does happen in isolation, but all it takes is one person to pick up on it and maybe report to lap that individual so they can receive some help. Uh, an ABA study showed that over 11% of attorneys have had thoughts of suicide at some point in their career. Maybe not serious, but, but even just thought of it, that we tend to um, we tend to think about it more than the general population. 90% of individuals who do uh, contemplate uh, 
who complete suicide had experienced a mental substance abuse or disorder or both. They usually go hand in hand. So listen for, what's the point? I can't get out of bed anymore. I don't see a future with me in it. I hate being a burden. My family would be better off without me. I just want to be left alone. I have nothing to live for, be excited about. I feel hopeless and worthless. And, you know, the, the pain of living is just so great that it overshadows any love that family, friends have for this individual. So it can be a, a critical time to get involved. So what do you do if you have a, a colleague or even, your, even if you yourself are thinking about something like this? First of all, don't argue like the right or wrong of suicide. That, that's an intellectual argument and it's not going to get to the, to the gut feelings that this person is experiencing. Platitudes don't work. You have so much to live for, it'll be a better day tomorrow. Not for them, that's not how they feel. It's not how they feel. And so don't discount their problems and refuse to keep the secret. If they ask you to keep it a secret, tell them that you just can't because you care about their, their welfare too much. You just, you just can't do it. Now, what uh, has been devised to you to ask questions of yourself when you're dealing with a person in this situation is the ACE card questionnaire that should be in your handout. That basically stands for ask, care, and escort. It's only six questions, so let's go over the questionnaire. It's designed for use by people like us. Here's first question. Have you ever wished you, within, um, in the past month, have you ever wished you were dead or wished you could go to sleep and not wake up? Yes or no? Have you actually had any thoughts about killing yourself? Yes or no? If you answer yes to two, to number two, you go to answer, you go to three or four. Otherwise, if it's no, you go down to six, which have you done anything, started to do anything, or prepared to do anything to end your life? If you answer yes to one, um, if you answer yes to two, then you go down to three. Have you thought about how much, how might you do this? Number four, have you had any intent of acting on these thoughts of killing yourself as opposed to ha you having the thoughts that you definitely would not act on them? Number five, have you started to work out or carried out the details of how to kill yourself? Do you intend to carry out this plan? And then in the past three months, have you done anything, started to do anything, or prepared to do anything to end your life? And uh, they did some examples, collecting pills, getting a fund, giving away valuables, writing a will or a suicide note, held a gun but changed your mind, cut yourself, tried to hang yourself, other things like that. Any yes is a cause for you to be taken seriously. And uh, people should seek help from family, friends, coworkers, and inform them as soon as possible if you come across someone who's answered yes to any of these. But if the answer is four, five, or six is yes, then you need to escort them to emergency personnel for care. That means dialing 911. Because you, if you, when, when we do law school, we do law school drop-ins. And we go, uh, we have an appointment day where we sit for four hours and we take anybody who wants to come in and talk. And one of the things that we've been told is that if someone answers yes, uh, to the three, four, five, that we're not to leave them alone. We're to call lab immediately uh, and get them involved and make sure that that person's never let alone. Because somebody's saying, oh, I'll get help tonight. It may be too late if, if you walk away from them. Because it feels like being in the bottom of a hole and no way to get out is, is what it is to feel Stuff, they're in the dark, they're overwhelmed, and they really can't do it for themselves. Most of us are used to feeling that we can do everything. We do everything for everybody else, right, as attorneys? But when it comes to getting out of depression, especially clinical depression, sometimes we just need help from somebody else because we can't do it on our own. And what do we say when someone is, is, is in a situation like this? is that 
basically, we're going to go down in the hole with them and stay there, uh, letting people know that they're not alone, that you're coming down <coughs> to help them get, get help to get out of the hole, that they don't need to stay down there. One of the issues that, that's newer that we're having to deal with more is the aging population, it's cognitive issues. And since I know they have Alzheimer's, I know all about this. Sad to say. Uh, so watch out uh, for increased isolation, decreased ability to plan ahead. And it's not just it's not just dementia. This could also be someone who's having medication issues or some other kind of physical issues that may be causing some kind of cognitive problems. But look at people who have decreased ability to plan ahead, to organize information, impaired judgment, uh, decreased ability to make so people that constantly ask, how do I do this again? Can you show me how to do this one more time? I'm not interested in doing it anymore. I'm not sure how it happened. Oh, I didn't put that on my calendar. I'm having a hard time understanding this right now. Or people who ask the same question over and over again that five minutes before asked you that question. Um, that's usually a sign that there, there may, be, may be some memory issues. And memory is different it's than cognitive, which is why they would need a good evaluation to find out what the problem is. Uh, sometimes we see clients over 60 who have chronic illnesses that are causing issues. Uh, diabetes can sometimes, if somebody has problems with their blood sugar, can cause temporary uh, mental issues. I saw that with my, my secretary when um, she was going through an episode. Uh, and a lot of people are reluctant to seek help and retire. They just don't want to let go of the license, even though they may not really be able to uh, deal with the day-to-day tasks -day, uh, involved in, in being an attorney. There's a higher suicide risk for people in, in their uh, over 60 these days. Uh, they um, tend to be white, male, and educated in over 50. That's true. Greater physical impairment, increased depression and anxiety. And I can't go without talking about the opioid uh, crisis because that's certainly a huge issue. The day I was getting trained as a peer support person downtown last June, the police were at my neighbor's house across the street taking out the body of her son who had died from an opiate overdose. Uh, who had just come back from rehabilitation, which is always the most dangerous time because tolerance for the drugs haven't built up. And, and we're seeing older people, uh, especially getting uh, hooked on opioids as a result of uh, increased surgeries. Heaven knows my brother was taking those too. Uh, and my dad had had so many surgeries, so I, I don't think he ever used to kill it, but I know, I'm pretty sure my brother did. So we're seeing more of that. No succession plan for people with, with cognitive problems, more financial pressure, uh, but it's impaired judgment that leads attorneys into uh, trouble uh, with respect to, to cognitive issues, the ability to plan ahead. So referring, what do you do when you find somebody in a situation like this? Well, we want you to call that. It's free, confidential. We're familiar with all legal environments. Uh, the services are tailored specifically to judges, lawyers, and law students. We have support groups for all those individuals. We even have yoga sometimes downtown here at the office. So we have other offices around the state as well. Uh, peer support groups, or, or peer support individuals, where we match up an attorney in, in, near you uh, who understands what your issues may be. And then we're able to refer you uh, for uh, to an attorney if you're having issues with character and fitness as a law student or with the ARDC. We don't contact the ARDC, but we can refer you to an attorney who uh, is well skilled in dealing with those kinds of issues. Now, so you can call or email lab. Our information is on the final page of the presentation. And we'll coach you on what to say to your colleague that you're dealing with. So you can call up and say, you know, there's an attorney in my office. I suspect there may be um, some alcohol issues going on. I know he's going through a bad divorce. And we'll talk, we'll talk to you. Uh, a, a, we have clinicians who are licensed uh, in psychology that can talk to you. 
about how to help someone. Uh, you can show the college the lab website to show that help is available. There's all kinds of resources on our website. And highlight the fact that this is all confidential, that the is not going to know about it, uh, you know, the colleagues aren't going to know about it. And you can say, look, it's, it's free to call and, and talk to them. Nobody needs to know. Let's do it together right now. Because some people can't take that step themselves. But if you're there with them, maybe they'll do it. Or you can say, how do I make a call for you? I'll get somebody on the line and then you can talk to them. They may be so unable to help themselves that they'll take you up on it and you won't know until you try. If, if a person is, is willing to come in um, or, be con or be contacted, an assessment's going to be done and a treatment plan of action is going to be put together. I was at the um, lab uh, banquet, I think it was last uh, April. No, it was in the fall. Uh, it was in November, it was in November. And we had testimonials from people who were now actively involved in volunteers, some of them for decades because lab saved their lives 30 years ago. It was so inspiring to see this. And I ran into a lot of attorneys that I knew that I came to find out had substance abuse issues, but they had dealt with them and now were lab volunteers. That was very eye-opening. If a person is not willing to contact lab, lab will reach out to the person themselves and invite them to come in. Uh, they'll contact trained lab volunteers who are bound by confidentiality, who may already know the person, because of working with them, they'll be matched with that person to try to reach out to that person. And lab stages interventions, and you go, well, how in the world did they do that? Well, they did a mock intervention at the training I went through, and many of them involved judges. Judges call the individual and say, I want to see you in my chambers tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock. How many attorneys are going to show up? Probably most of them. They may not necessarily know why, but in the meantime, lab has uh, brought in colleagues, family, uh, regular intervention that is well known to the substance abuse community. The attorney shows up, doesn't, nobody forces a person to stay, but if they do, they go through the intervention and then offer them re a rehab uh, facility right then and there. And, it, and apparently, it works really well. The judges were saying he hasn't had anybody turn him down yet when, when they got a call from the judge saying, it, so we can help with stress, anxiety, grief, depression, career transitions, addiction, substance abuse, and many more things. It's a wonderful program. Uh, you pay for it, so take advantage of it, either by helping others or helping yourselves. Uh, we can provide short-term <coughs> counseling, support groups, referrals, interventions, and help with ARDC concerns. There's really no reason not to make, take advantage of the services, so I really hope you will. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer anything. If you have anything you want to ask me about. No? Okay, well, thank you very much for your time. Staff is swamped many times with trying to help people who are calling and needing help as opposed to being out and driving out to uh, uh, Northern Illinois University and sitting for four hours at a, a, a drop-in. 
or uh, for a bar association. So that's how you can get involved. And LAP is available for presentations for all kinds of groups. Uh, I've been, I've talked to bar associations and uh, small and large. This is the largest group so far, but I've done a luncheon for like 10 people for a women's bar out, out, out a distance away. I did uh, orientation at John Marshall Law School talking to law students about what services that, that we can present to them. So we do all kinds of education, and so feel free to uh, to contact them. I've had people leave and then want me to come back for another presentation for a different group, and you can do that through LAP. They will uh, ask me if, I, if I'm available, if, if you need that kind of training for any group that you're involved in. But uh, we do a lot of, of work, and if you're interested in, in getting uh, Acting as a volunteer, sign up for the, uh, the training. There's a cost to cover the cost of CLEs and so forth. I think it was like $37 or something. And it included a very nice lunch uh, and, and breakfast, too. I think it was on this too. Yeah. So uh, you're welcome to uh, get involved. We'd love to have you. Um, because everybody has stories to share. And uh, those of you who are in recovery, it's a great way to give back to thank the people that helped you. So thank you very much. So um, I think what we'll do is just kind of power straight through. It's, it's open minds instead of taking a, a break. And then maybe we can actually get out of here a little, a little early um, so, you know, under those circumstances. So our last speaker uh, of the day, not least, is Ina Ninko. Uh, Ina is with the Women's Fire Association of Illinois, and she's here today to talk with us about diversity uh, and inclusion issues yeah. in practice. And Ina was gracious uh, enough to come back. Um, uh, she spoke with us last year, and uh, her uh, discussion last year was very